Agencies Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps agencies streamline their proposals in the cloud and get faster sign-off. Welcome to the 18th episode of Agencies Drinking Beer. On today's show, we're going to be talking to Bill Faith from Inbound Marketing Agents, and he's going to tell us what he learned from starting 22 businesses. What are we chatting about today? Well, we're actually going to chat and introduce uh, Bill Faith, um, this awesome entrepreneur we interviewed, very much uh, a man after my own heart. Yes. Um, of course. You're he, in love? I think I am. A little man crush there. 22 businesses, uh, very successful. Um, you basically wrote our headline for us, I like know. 22 startups. I know. Jeez. I know. He's not that old either. But plus, he was a golf pro. I know. I mean, that's incredible. He's a firecracker. He that's is. what they would call him. Yep. Somewhere. <laughs> um, man, I saw a pretty f- cool post today. Six reasons why dating can be a nightmare for some entrepreneurs. On entre- entrepreneur.com. Does it sound familiar? Mm. Why do Why do entrepreneurs have a hard time finding love? Well, you found love, but, you know, a lot of people Because they're always with on to the next venture. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why. They prioritize business first. Yes, but yeah. they also treat their relationships like being an entrepreneur. Well, that's uh, I think that's what the post talks about is they suffer from the bigger, better deal syndrome. Yep, which some people call the grass is always greener. Yep, or shiny ball syndrome. Um, okay. You never heard that one? No. Somebody's got shiny ball syndrome? Like, ooh, there's a shiny ball. Oh, okay. okay. I thought Not I testicles. Shiny oh, testicle yeah, okay. syndrome. Yeah, um, yeah it's... It, you know, definitely, I think anybody who is an entrepreneur would uh, find they might have some of these traits, so I don't know. Mm. There's a good book that my dad, my dad was just visiting, um, and uh, he suggested I read a book called The Entrepreneur Roller Coaster. I look forward to checking that out. Mm. It, is an, it is a roller coaster for sure. sure. Is, yeah. And I'm afraid of roller coasters. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> yeah, but not afraid of being an entrepreneur. I find, um, I used to love rides when I was a kid. I hate them now. Yeah. I guess I'm getting old. You are. I hate rides. You're older than me. I think about safety constantly when I'm on a ride. Mm. But also it could be that the little fairs they have here in, you know, Dartmouth, I don't trust as much as I would trust like Disney World or Universal. They're run by carnies. They smell like cabbage. There's, you know. They do smell like cabbage. (laughs) Never thought of that. (laughs) Yeah, I don't trust the local fair. They're shady. Yeah, and you think about how they break them down and set them back up in you know multiple cities throughout the year. They always seem rusty. Yeah, yeah. It, it always reminded me of when you know at, at Christmas when you're putting your toys together. You know they're in pieces and you put them together, and then oftentimes, or your kid fixing your bike, and you're like, oh, geez, where's that bolt go? Well, I don't really need it. It still works. Mm. Or that cotter pin. I'm sure there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, there probably is. That's why I loved Universal, because a lot of their rides, at least the ones I could take Micah on, were the ones where you just have a screen around you, and you're in a seat that doesn't, it moves around a little bit, but you're not, like, mm. getting shot off in, from a cannon into the sky. The know? people that are running the ride smell good. Yeah, the, no cabbage smell. No, yep. Normal-sized hands. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, let's uh, jump into the interview with Bill Faith. Let's do it. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Bill Faith from Inbound Marketing Agents, uh, based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, Bill runs an agency that's a Platinum HubSpot certified partner. So welcome to the show, Bill. Hey, thanks, Kyle. It's uh, awesome to be here. And Kevin, uh, I'm really excited about chatting with you guys today. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into it. So first off, um, I'd like to, you know, just tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to start Inbound Marketing Agents. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I've kind of had a, uh, a lengthy background of, uh, you know, successes and failures. Inbound Marketing Agents is my 22nd startup uh, that I've done since 1989. Uh, number one was actually a t-shirt uh, 
company that I started in high school and grew that into uh, about a $400,000 a year business my uh, junior and senior year, believe it or not, uh, selling t-shirts at high school and uh, basketball, football games that we sourced through Los Angeles. I grew up in Bakersfield, California and kind of got the entrepreneurial bug um, at that point. I was a golfer growing up and went to UCLA and dropped out after my freshman year to turn professional. Um, played professional golf for many, many years, been to every uh, state in the United, every state in the country except for Alaska and Maine, actually. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> the freak states. <laughs> hey, watch that. Maniacs. I've been to, I've also been to 41 countries. So kind of, I think one of the most interesting things, at least from my perspective, is I was playing the South American PJ Tour in 1996. Um, and I met this family outside of Sao Paulo, Brazil, that lived in about a 1,200, no, not even that, probably an eight, 900 square foot mud hut. And they were hand manufacturing bikinis and Brazilian swimwear. So literally about nine months after I had played there, I had this crazy idea in 1997, like around June um, or May, that I wanted to sell those online. And you got to remember, man, I was th that's in the day I've got dial-up connection. I'm using AOL, and I wanted to figure out a way to build out a website and buy these bikinis from them in Brazilian swimwear. And lo and behold, about $160,000 later to build a website and an e-commerce platform, I was selling bellaquabikinis.com online and that was my first kind of real business venture outside of my kind of small startups through college and when I was playing professional golf and um, after about 18 months um, I built it up to just over a million dollars in revenue and got acquired by Venus Swimwear and uh, thank goodness that happened prior to the the crash at the millennium and the, you know the bubble and I didn't turn out to be like pets.com or anything like that so that was kind of my first foray into you know the online world if you will and you know, I've done some really odd businesses. So when I quit playing professional golf, I started a restaurant, Wild Bill's Texas Smokehouse, um, and grew that into six different restaurants. And wow. that was after uh, Bell Aqua Bikinis. And then... Can we call you Wild Bill from now on? You, you sure can. Okay. I, I'll answer to anything. Just don't call me late for the, you know, drinking beer uh, <laughs> podcast. So I've got, I do have my Sam Adams sitting here. It's a little early for me being well 9, 9.15 in the morning, but I'll crack it before we get <laughs> done. Is it the lager? I need to know that. Is it the lager or is it the uh, Bo Boston, Boston lager? I brought it with me because oh, I went nice. to the Eric Church concert uh, here in Nashville last night. And so we had a couple of extras. So I just brought them in this morning. And uh, why not just keep the fun going, right? That's yes. awesome. Well done, sir. So the, I guess the other thing, too, is really that I wanted to touch on from a business standpoint. So it's not just traditional businesses. I started a company called Glow Golf, which is glow-in-the-dark miniature golf courses and shopping malls around the country after I got done playing professional golf. And I think that's really where I learned um, a lot of components that have tied over into how I operate my agency today. And people on listening to the podcast where I think, well, how the heck does a retail mini golf business, and hopefully some of you have seen them around the country, relate to an agency? It's because we have employees. We have operations. Um, even though we're a marketing agency, I think where a lot of agencies overlook or when they start to fail is because they don't understand how to streamline their operational processes. And they're just looking at, you know, hours for dollars. And so I'm a big believer in efficiency. And one thing that's really unique about our Glow Golf business, we have 78 locations in North America right now. We have six line items on our P&L every month. That's it. It's the most simplistic business um, that you've probably ever seen, not only in reality, the physicality of running it, but also on paper. And when I first started this agency three and a half years ago, I went from zero to $1.1 million in revenue and 17 employees in 10 months. And that was a very fast ramp that caused a tremendous amount of issues within our agency to grow that quickly from bad retainers to you know sacrificing and, and not going through extensive interview processes and personality testing to just implementing the operational process to where our margin ended up diminishing. At that time, we were only operating at about a 11% margin, and now we actually are operating at over a 31% margin. Whoa. Yeah, I can imagine how, uh, you know, we talk about growing pains with a business, and I mean, even we weren't doing that when we were running Headspace, but just even adding a couple new employees seems to 
you know, just add that layer of complication and, and, you know, hurts your cash flow until you start really generating revenue off of them. So I can't imagine what going to 17 would have done. And, and it was tough. So when I started this agency, I just wanted to be a consultant. I didn't want to, I had no delusions of grandeur of, of creating a full marketing agency. And it was my business partner who was a previous uh, sweat equity partner with me in a previous venture and myself in my basement. And the whole goal for me was I have young kids. I wanted to get back to playing golf because I hadn't played that much golf recently. And I just wanted to consult and we we're going to work out of my basement and not like two guys in our underwear coding like anonymous in a basement. It's a pretty nice basement. It set up a really cool office and everything. And, um, but what happened was is literally 11 days or 12 days, I guess, after I started uh, the agency, I got a call from a $150, $160 million company in Secaucus, New Jersey and out of the industry that I was in previously, which was the limousine, the ground transportation industry, and it was the largest company in the industry at that time. And I flew up there and we had our first $24,000 a month retainer with our third client. But now I had to have a designer, I had to have an account manager, we had to do everything for them. They didn't have the infrastructure in that size of a company, company believe it or not, for us to be able to consult. So we had to build out that infrastructure quickly and as soon as we took on that client, and we had that type of, you know, kind of big name recognition, you know how that works, a lot of others followed. And that's how we were able to scale so quickly. Wow. I see why they call you Wild Bill. Yeah, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, going back to your entrepreneurial spirit, I'm sure instead of uh, Dr. Seuss, your parents were reading you Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wish that was the case. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a little personal insight from me. Um, my, I, I grew up as an only child. Um, with a single mother and we were my mother was a teacher you know growing up in the the 80s and early 90s in Southern California living on forty five thousand dollars a year you know as a teacher I'm not gonna say we were poor we didn't have issues with putting food on the table but we didn't have any money that's for sure and I was wearing tough skins from Sears for three years now I'm six foot six 210 pounds so I'm, those things are high waters after about six months when you're a kid right Shorts, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but I think one thing that, you know, you bring up that entrepreneurial spirit, being a latchkey kid, you know, basically getting myself to and from school when I was in third grade, feeding myself, my mother working two jobs, um, going through the Big Brother program, not having a father. And then most importantly, when I stopped playing soccer, basketball, baseball, and focused on golf my freshman year in high school when I really started to become good. The one thing about golf is it's an individual sport. I had to drive myself. I had to motivate myself. I had to learn all of this at a young age because you don't have a coach. You don't have a team to be able to push you. And I think that's where a lot of my ADD, quadruple type A entrepreneurial spirit and drive and motivation was built at that point. Um, you know, through those formative teenage years of my life, all I did in high school was play golf, go to school, got straight A's until my senior year. And, you know, graduated with National Honor Society and all that type of stuff. But I don't think I would be in the position today with that entrepreneurial spirit without having that upbringing, you know. And I know I'm supposed to be the kid that's really effed up, right, because of not having a father and going through all that type of stuff. But for me, I think it was an advantage. We have very similar backgrounds. Very similar. That's inspiring. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just enjoying hearing you, you talk. I mean... The personal um, story, I think, is resonates with, with a lot of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We haven't all had the same experience, but it almost seems like the, the kids who are born with the most, you know, the kids who are born with the silver spoon, um, I don't know, just from personal experience, tend to not have as much of that entrepreneurial drive as the ones who, who struggled growing up. True. I, I agree, and I think, you know, it's... I don't want to make too big of a generalization, but I think it's part of, you know, Generation C that's coming up next. And, you know, it's, it's e I, th I think it's easier for kids now growing up, and I think we fondle them too much, and it's the whole, you know, participation trophy, you know, thing that I, I fundamentally disagree with. I mean, I think you have to learn how to earn everything, um, you know, in life. And I think there's a huge component in our culture that's missing that right now. And I think I would love to try to get back to that. But that also leads being in the mar as a marketing agency, being the owner, founder, CEO, whatever my title is today, I call myself a human being, I actually steal that from the great Chris Brogan. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is the hard thing for me, the hardest part for me running my agency 
is because of that mindset is having, you know, 85% of my workforce being millennials and, you know, communicating with hey, them. Hey, now so, I'm, a, I'm a millennial. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I think millennials are awesome, especially in the marketing, but in the marketing agency world, the problem is, is the communication gap between me being the old guy at 42 years old, being an old school, I'm kind of have the mind and body of probably a 60 year old. And, you know, it's from starting all those businesses. It, it is. And I, there's, there's a lot of tread that's been worn off of those wheels over the last 22 years. Right. Yeah. So I think but that mentality is different. So that was probably my biggest pratfall, to be honest with you, in the formative years of this agency, probably the first two years. And it really started to change about nine and a half, well, actually a year ago, um, almost to the date, actually, when I recruited and hired um, Jessica Bowers, who is now my marketing director. And she is, uh, she's a millennial. I won't tell you her age because she'd get mad at me. I'm sure she's going to listen to this. Um, but she's kind of that buffer, that transition point, because she can communicate with those millennials, but she also has the entrepreneurial spirit, the management skills, the mentality, you know, for the accountability and deadlines and, you know, everything that has to go into running an effective agency where I think I'm a little bit too brash, a little bit too abrasive. So she's the one that handles all the operations now and I can kind of step back out of that and have a little bit softer relationship with the staff, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm 51 and, you know, Kyle's 31. So Kyle's kind of that person you're describing that you've hired, uh, you know, because Kyle is a partner. Even though he's younger, he definitely um, can relate. I often feel out of the loop on some of the stuff, but uh, it is challenging. You know, we, we come from a different background, different era, you know? Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. What, okay, so s switching gears a little bit, what I'd, I'd like to know is um, you talked about some of these businesses, and, I mean, that's, it's amazing that to be able to even start those businesses and have, uh, have some of them successful over such a short period of time. Um, can you talk more about, you know, so those businesses that you started, you know, uh, some of them you sold, are some still running, have some, like, were there any just abysmal failures that you came away from, like, okay, lesson learned, you know, where, where, what's the state of those, those businesses now? Plenty of abysmal failures, you know, in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think really the, the second one that I started was an auto detailing uh, company in, the, uh, in probably 93, the year after I, I left UCLA and started playing professional golf. And one of my best friends from uh, Bakersfield, California, had graduated with his MBA from Fresno State. and He was having some serious life issues. And I gave him an opportunity and said, hey, I'll, I, I made some money playing golf. I said, hey, I'll put in 30 grand and I'll buy a trailer and a truck and we'll, you know, I'll set you up for a mobile detailing company because nobody was really doing that in 1992, right? And long story short, um, he was able to clean up his life and run it. And I didn't give him anything. I gave him 20% of the company. So he had to earn everything. No hourly wage, no salary, nothing. And I gave him a couch to sleep on in my apartment at that time. And long story short is over about five years, he built it into a 2.4 million dollar a year business and you know he went from one to six crews um, now he's got 11 crews in two cities in Bakersfield California and in Fresno California still operating the business um, and he's just gone and bought another franchise and literally about nine months ago did you start paying him a salary yet um, no no <laughs> he's not I mean so now he owns he owns he owns eighty percent of the company, and I own twenty percent of the company. And that took him about five years to get to that point. So he had twenty percent right off the bat, and then my whole goal was to make him a majority owner. So in every business that I've ever started, uh, with the exception of Glow Golf, where I'm a fifty fifty partner with my partner in Wichita, um, I should really clarify my wife's the fifty fifty partner, just in case she listens to this, so I don't get in trouble. Um, my goal is to build a business that I can hand over uh, to my employees. So that way I can make the, the, the small residual income and I can create an employee-owned company. may not be every employee, may just be those strategic employees. And the same thing's happening here at, at IMA. Uh, Jessica being uh, that employee, number one. And then I've got two others um, that will be vested with equity um, as well. Cool. Okay. So that that's that's really cool. So it's almost like you're you know, you're digging and doing the hard work, getting it started, because it's, I mean, as we all know, with, with businesses, it's that first 
couple years are really the toughest to, you know, it's almost like starting those old Flintstone cars, you know, you got to put in lots of the legwork to get it moving, and then once it's got momentum, it sort of, you know, you guide it and it's, it runs itself, but once it gets to that point, you know, you're kind of handing it off to the people who helped you get there, and and kind of moving on to the next thing. Well, yeah, em- empowering people is, is the key. It sounds like you're, you're finding good people to do that with. Yeah, I, I, I think you're 100% correct, Kevin. And, you know, I think that, I, I think the 22 startups, Kyle, is once again kind of the shiny key syndrome for me. I get bored easily, right? And, the, I mean, the outside of the auto detailing company, which has been, you know, 20 years, is the glow golf business which i'm really a silent partner at this point and it's we've been doing that since 2002 everything else for me typically has about a three-year lifespan and then i want to go and start start something uh new you know i'm past three years with ima and i think it's a little bit different because this i mean the whole inbound marketing digital marketing world has changed dramatically in the last three years we're going through a, a very dramatic switch and our business model right now. What, what's um, changed? Um, well, I mean, we so we're we we're obviously a HubSpot partner. We do inbound marketing with you know enterprise clients all the way down to probably five million dollar a year businesses on the small end. We provide search engine optimization. We do web development. You know, those are and social media management. Those are really our four core verticals. But one thing that I think is still hard to do is to scale, and all those clients are different. So whether it's a limousine client, a publishing company, an e-commerce company, what's critical for me in my belief to be successful, and this is where I think my experience in business becomes very, very critical for our success, and it's proven that in our model, is to learn the business model of our client. If we really don't dive in and understand our business model, we can't market their company effectively. Tying into their sales process, tying into their operations process. Um, Jessica and myself are in Baltimore uh, with one of our clients last week. And before we're completely revamping their entire sales process. But before we could do that, we had to go and spend time physically with their team and understand their operational uh, delivery because they're a service-based company. And we identified that there are about 18 points that need to be changed in their operations for us to be extremely successful from a marketing standpoint. Well, I'm not going to be able to take a a 20, 25-year-old company and change all 18 of those to update their sales process and the marketing process in a week. So it's going to take some time to be able to roll that out. But if I would have never truly understand their operational component of their business, I don't think that we ever could have hit, um, you know, really the goals that they had set and been as effective as a marketing company. And that's what I see where a lot of marketing companies just think about the traditional ways of marketing and they don't understand fully how that rolls into the other components of a business. That's because the majority of people running, especially startups or startup or small agencies have never run businesses. They don't understand what you understand. And it sounds like it trickles down to your team. Well, yeah, and it also sounds like um, when you're talking inbound marketing, there's sort of that scope of where where does marketing begin and end. And, you know, for somebody who calls himself an inbound marketer, you know, they're focused on really getting traffic to your site and converting it into a lead. And then sort of once that's done, they've, you know, they're dusting their hands off. They've done their job. And you're saying it kind of goes further. Well, and yeah, I mean, to quote Gary V, Gary Vanyerchuk, that's a huge fucking problem. <laughs> you know, hopefully you can delete that. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't no, stop. No, we like it, S-bombs. It doesn't stop at a, a sales qualified lead or a marketing qualified lead. It right. stops when that customer dies. But it has to it has to be a qualified lead, though. I mean, I think it's even you got to back up. If you drop, you're driving the wrong traffic and the wrong leads, it, you know, you, mm. you have to understand the business, like you said. Uh, absolutely. But I think to what you said, Kyle, and I agree with you, Kevin, is marketers stop when they hand over that MQL or SQL. Well, I mean, my gosh, that's where you really got to dive deep into the sales process, especially if you're handing, handing it over to a salesperson, because they may be an MQL at, you know, stage step three or step four of a six or a seven or a nine step sales process. But then what happens with, you know, at the determination component, win or lose, most salespeople, when they lose a customer, they're done. That's where we step back in and we're continuing to nurture. We want to nurture those lost leads so we can bring them back as a customer. And that kind of brings me to my number one campaign that I have ever launched is called a We Want You Back campaign. 
and it's going into the databases of, I don't care what business you're in and you figure out what customers you've lost over a period of time and then you create a campaign to recapture them because believe me, your competitors are not doing that. Hmm. When they lose a customer, they're done. When I dump Proposify and I go to Quote Roller, no. very few people are you, guys, are you guys nurturing me when you're done. If you're not, you need to. Yeah. I think that is a huge component. And I, that's a, a good analogy because I went the opposite. I used to be a quote, quote Roller client and I left to come over to Proposify and I have never heard once from Quote Roller uh, for the last however long I've been with you guys, six, nine, ten months. Hmm. Um, and I think that's a huge lost opportunity that every single marketer and business owner needs to take advantage of because we all lose customers. And what happens is, as I look at that attrition rate, it's usually the smaller to medium-sized customers that we're really not paying as close attention to. All of a sudden, you go six months or nine months or a year and like, holy shit, I'm down 20% in revenue. Where did it go? Well, you didn't make any effort to retain them, first of all, and nurture them through the customer experience that stopped at one or loss, and then you're not trying to re either identify or reacquire the customers that you're actually losing. I think some of that comes down to people just um, feeling like once you've lost a customer, that's it. There's no way to get them back, and you, you know they don't want to hear from you. And sometimes it's it's really the opposite. They just, uh, you know, it wasn't the right time for them in their business, or there's lots of reasons why people cancel subscriptions or leave you know uh companies and we i think we do this about maybe once every six months to every year as we look back at all the customers that canceled and we send an email campaign to see be like hey just you know checking in maybe proposify wasn't the right you know time for you at that time or we've improved some features or fixed some things that maybe maybe give it another shot try another free trial that sort of thing i, I feel, love it i have a feeling though bill you think that six months is probably too long maybe we should shorten that and Maybe have a trigger where we, when we know someone's left, maybe getting right back to them while they're still warm. What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, if they're an existing customer, I mean, I would probably give them at least 90 days. But I think what, what I'm talking about is, you know, creating that lost funnel to where it's, it's automated, but it's personalized, right? And so where you can, you can create it and then you can forget about it. And when they, if they come back in and they start re, reactivating you know then you have your your lost funnel lead scoring set up so you can try to reacquire them as a customer and they go right back into the initial uh, you know sales process so I just think it's something that a lot of people miss I, I don't really want to say six months is the right or the wrong time because I think it's different for every single you know business model and I think a lot of it would have to do with your your churn rate and your volume of customers as well this is one of the reasons why I love SaaS, you know, software businesses, is because it kind of forces you into a certain amount of uh, discipline and structure behind your business model. You know, you, you're forced to know the lifetime value of your customer, your churn rate, your conversion to paid, your average rev revenue per account. There's a lot of metrics that you, you know, we just always have our eye on. Um, that you know, like I said, forces that kind of discipline. And have you found dealing with other types of customers and, and clients where you're working to understand their business model that they're just not knowing any of that stuff because we I mean I didn't know it when we were running our agency I, you know if you had asked me what's your average revenue per customer or what's their lifetime value or how what percentage leave after a certain time I would have had no clue I can tell you in, um, in our process to acquire a new customer um, we have an IMA, no pun intended for us as inbound marketing agents, but it's an inbound marketing assessment. And the first question that we ask them is, what's your average sales price? Number two is, what's the lifetime value of that customer? Number three is your COCA, what's your cost of customer acquisition? Probably 90% of the people cannot answer. I think the first company that I ever provided that to in my three years that was able to answer was Bedrock Data. Uh, which is a client of ours. It just so happens there are three former HubSpot guys that have built a SaaS company, so they do know that. And I think that kind of goes back to the business experience for me. Hey, you tell me you want 100 SQLs a month. What's the value of them? Just clarify, what is an SQL? A sales qualified lead. Okay. Or an MQL, a marketing qualified lead. So they set their goals or they want to grow revenue, but they don't know my cost of customer acquisition. They don't know my average sales price. They don't know my lifetime value. They don't know their conversion rates, you know, and their opportunity pipelines. They don't know any of that. For us, 
we won't take on a customer um, if they don't know it and if they're not willing to learn it. We have to have that data before we take on a customer. And I would say out of those 90% that don't know it, 50 to 60% do know it once they go through our sales process. Um, and hopefully that's part of inbound, or at least my methodology is I want to educate these people. And you know, whether you become a client of mine or not, you know, hopefully you learn something going through our sales process to, to benefit your business. And it sounds like this is what you've taken from those, you know, tw- is it 21, 22 startups is uh, that that discipline of understanding all of your key performance ind- indicators, your KPIs and, you know, kind of going through that process. It sounds like you've brought that to your agency, whereas a lot of agency owners just don't know that stuff. They just focus on one day at a time, getting getting a new client, making sure they're happy and moving on to the next without really seeing the bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, back to Bell Aqua Bikinis, you know, I mean, in, in 98, 97, I mean, I spent 180 grand to build a website and a shopping cart, which is ridiculous. You know, you can go to Shopify and WordPress and build build something awesome out for, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 grand. And awesome. You can do it cheaply for under 10 grand, right? So, the, like, one of the things that I learned in that business is I grew it to over a million dollars in revenue, but... I didn't know how to manage at that time my P&Ls. I didn't know how to manage my balance sheets. I didn't know how to, uh, you know, manage my payback on my investment and, you know, all of my asset reduction and all that type of stuff. And that's where I had to go through that first really big learning curve of, hey, I just exited this company. Why did I only make like $70,000 when I exited this company? Because I had debt and I had all these other components and I wasn't profitable leading up to it. You know, and it wasn't, you know, 2012 where, you know, I can be Uber and go out and lose money doing over a billion dollars a year in revenue. Mm. So, I mean, I think that that was probably one of the hardest lessons that I had to learn is I thought I was going to literally net over half a million dollars on the exit of that. And it was like 72 grand by the time I was done because I didn't have my shit together on the accounting side on the back end. I did not know my numbers to where Mr. Wonderful would have just shot me right through the eyes in the shark tank. Is that Kevin O'Leary? Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, th- I find like this is my second business that I've ever run, and, and I feel more confident leading into it just because of that experience of before. And I'm sure you find the same. Well, you've run more businesses, Kevin. Yeah, but I uh, my businesses were, you know, in the uh, late 80s, 90s, more traditional business. So, uh, you know, the agency was a first for me. But you sold coffee online. That's that true. E-commerce that is true. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's just. Um, is it just a matter of just you have to have that experience? You have to kind of run a business at least once uh, before you can truly be a success. Or do you think that uh, you know, for first-time entrepreneurs, you know, there's some takeaways that they can hopefully learn from others' mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest with you. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, you have to have hands on experience with that because you don't really grasp that theory, learning it in the classroom, right? Rather, you could be at Harvard or you could be at, you know, wherever, whatever university until you're in it and it's your cash. You really don't understand the ramifications of not knowing those numbers, in my opinion. Um, you know, and, and I don't think that our universities do a great job of, you know, really giving that type of granular experience and granular detail of what goes into running a business because they're preparing people for jobs in most cases. I know there's great entrepreneurial programs that are popping up and I'm a member of the EO Entrepreneurs Organization and I love it, but I just don't think there's enough out there to be able to go through that. And you have to go through that experience, you know, and that's one thing where, I mean, I've, I've had a. I've actually had a mentor in every one of my businesses that I've started with the exception of this agency. Um, I didn't really have a mentor. I I guess I would call HubSpot my mentor because I was a client of theirs for five and a half years before I uh, started this agency. But, you know, I think having that mentorship and learning from somebody that has gone through those pratfalls, like my partner in um, my glow golf business, he's probably 70 years old. And he was the third franchisee in the Pizza Hut in 1968. And, you know, he had 40 years of experience, even though he still doesn't use a computer or he does now a little bit. But up until about three or four years ago, we would do P&Ls on literally uh, graph paper and he would fax them to me. You know, that's cool. But I got to learn 
you know, even more from him because of that old school methodology and those 40 years of experience. I found that um, the agency was hard for me because I had a lot of experience, but in past, even even with the e-commerce, with the coffee, I had a product I was selling. With with agencies, it's it's so much time. You're selling time of your of your team, and you know that was hard to get used to and, and learn. And, and you learn as you go. And um, I found that the most challenging. And has that changed selling HubSpot or or selling the HubSpot process and methodology? So we're, we're a retainer based agency for about eighty percent of our revenue. So, you know, tomorrow's the first of the month, right? And we're 100% profitable tomorrow when we bill everybody on the first of the month. You know, now, and it's very kind of similar for you guys, right? I have to make sure that I have efficiency and I have margin left over at the end of the month. Today is the last day of the month. What is my margin at midnight tonight? Because I was 100% profitable 31 days ago. And I think that's what's really difficult for the retainer business. People, marketers that don't have the business savvy that are coming into this, think, wow, I can charge five grand or 10 grand or a thousand or whatever my retainer is going to be. And I've got them locked into an annual contract. But what they don't understand is how to scale and create that efficiency and manage the time on a retainer base. So I've actually learned a ton in probably the last 16 months from a client and a good friend of mine who's become a very good friend of mine that owns a pasta manufacturing company. And I've really tried to make changes in the way that we operate to maximize our retainer value, maximize our throughput, maximize our efficiency based on what he does as a manufacturing company and change that mindset. The problem with that is the generational gap between me and my millennial staff. They don't think that way. That's why I need somebody like Jessica who can absorb my content the whole manufacturing process, the whole efficiency creation, the whole optimization of time and value and be able to implement with the millennials for me. Here's a silly little question from a millennial. What's what's throughput? I've heard you say that a few times. I should know this. So throughput, like in the manufacturing world, is you know, how many units are you are you throughputting in a minute or an hour or a day? Um, you know, so like with my buddy John who owns the pasta shop, it's how many cases are, do they have for throughput in a 24 hour period? That's really his number one KPI for me when I have, you know, 47 clients, uh, that we're working on and I have 17 people that are working on them. What is their throughput on a daily basis? So we, even though we don't bill time wise outside of a select number of consulting only clients, we are retainer based, we still track our time. And I think a good analogy is my social media manager who's in the conference room next door to me. I was having a conversation with him this morning. He has this great awards idea for one of our customers that he wants to implement and get a lot of um, you know, potential user generated content that'll be coming in um, outside of our client to help support their community. And it looks like a really big project to me. So we sit down and we talk about how much time do you estimate that you're going to have to put into this? What are your KPIs for measurement for your goals that you're going to achieve? And how is this going to benefit the client? And if he comes back and he gives me metrics of it's going to grow community growth and number of likes on Facebook and all this bullshit, I say, I don't care about that. How much money is this going to make our client over a 30-day period, over a 60-day period, over a 90-day period? And that's what the goal has to be set on because that's how we're being held accountable because we're 100% closed looped with this client. And I think that's the other issue where the efficiency and the value becomes critical in the decision making process before you decide to launch a campaign and tying that to those actual goals of the company. Hmm. And I think that's where marketers get really, really disjointed from the true inbound process is they think, okay, I got to write X amount of blog articles a month. I got to do X amount of social media posts a month. I got to create X amount of eBooks a month. And they just do the same thing over and over and over. And they create this assembly line. Well, that worked five years ago or even three years ago. It sure as heck doesn't work today. We've got to do things differently. We've got to create different content, more valuable content. And we've got to adjust because it's ever changing and it's so saturated today, right? And for me, it's all about time, throughput, and value for the customer. And I, lo I look at my business just like a manufacturing business, but in kind of a creative way. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's 
really cool to listen to. I think that'll be huge uh, value for our listeners. So mm. uh, entertaining one, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the show, Bill. I think we're out of time now, but uh, again, we're that done. Was huge what, value. what do you mean? We can't be done yet. I've got a lot more to share. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, let's, we'll have a, let's have a part two. Seriously. Yeah, it, I'm sure there's a lot more to chat about uh, for sure. So, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Kyle, Kevin, thank you guys very much. It was my pleasure. Would love to do a part due with you. So uh, just hit, hit me up any time. And, you know, thank you to uh, all the listeners. Hope you guys enjoyed it today. That's great. Thanks. Have a great Friday and, and a good weekend. Thanks, guys. Right, take Talk care. to you soon. See take you. care. Great interview, man after my own heart. Um, Your man crush. Man crush. Man, that guy's awesome. Yeah. I don't know. He insulted millennials a lot. I was kind of offended by that. I was that. surprised by that, yeah. 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 So he, he needs an interpreter to, to talk to his millennial staff. Well, I mean, we have a bit of a generation gap, 20 years. Do you feel like, uh, I think we communicate quite well. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't understand all of your uh, 40s and 50s references, but, uh, or even the 70s references. Yeah. Really? You 70s? like you like pulling out those references. I wasn't alive in the 70s. I can't, but I can't help it. That's... That, that was some of the best times of my life, the 70s. It was just bright and cheery. Oh, don't worry. It'll happen to me because I, <laughs> I make 80s and 90s references that you probably don't get. Like that whole intro where we talked about people, the carnies, smelling like cabbage and small hands, those were Austin Powers references. Oh, see, I didn't get that. Yeah, I was subtle about it. Wow. So I'm sure, you know, once once my sons are older... I'll be making all these 90s references, and they'll be like, what? Or even You're early 2000. I know. Yeah. It's just life. You know what the key is, though? It's the circle. The circle of life. On that bit of weirdness, let, uh, let's let take off for now, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Later.